Well, sisters and brothers in Christ, grace to you and peace from God, our creator, and Jesus Christ, who gives us strength and peace. Amen. Tucked away in rural Minnesota, in the woods and lakes, surrounded by acres of natural prairie, there's a Benedictine monastery that's also a college called St. John's. For a small donation, you can stay in their guest house. And by no means is this the Ritz, but there is a simple and comfortable bed, a desk, and a crucifix on the wall. Four times a day, you are invited to join the brothers for prayer. And in this giant, cavernous, modern stone and stained glass chapel, their voices echo in chant, and the psalms just reverberate off the sides of the building, and it's as if their prayers just loft straight to heaven. The last week in August, I had the honor of being a guest of these Benedictine brothers. And for three days, I prayed, and I read, and I exercised, and I enjoyed their hospitality, and I tasted what seemed like a holy contentment. Then I went to my parents for what was Labor Day weekend in a house overflowing with guests and people busy with lawn games and lake activities and kids running everywhere. I came back here to Rally Sunday and programs and soccer and special classes. I came back to my smartphone and Netflix and Amazon Prime. <laughs> and that's when I realized, for as much discipline as it takes to choose a monastic life, those brothers actually had it kind of easy. See, for those of us who are outside of those walls, there's no bell that reminds us to pray. There's not scripture sung at us multiple times a day. The only silence is sometimes when we are actually sleeping. And if we are surrounded by woods and water, sometimes they're just a blur as we go past them on our way from one commitment to another. So can there be no contentment outside of a cloister? The person who was writing this book to Timothy didn't think so. They thought that contentment was actually a gift of the Spirit. Hear those words again from Timothy. The writer says, of course, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. Peace. Satisfaction, not striving, enoughness, a book on the porch with a cat purring in your lap. I wonder what contentment looks like to you. The root of the Greek word for contentment is autokaria, which is a stoic concept, which means not being bothered by external circumstances. And in a Christian spiritual sense, contentment means recognizing and knowing deep down that you are enough, just as you are, that all that you have is a gift from God, and that you trust that God abides. No matter the circumstances of your life, God is with you and God is good. Contentment. Who wouldn't want this? I found this picture of this beautiful baby and her mother. You can see that she is resting peacefully, trusting so deeply in the one who gave her life. Who doesn't want that? But at the same time, who, as an adult, can actually achieve that, and not only that, but then sustain it? Is it only for those who live in monasteries? Because contentment is hard. I would say that actually it's enemy number one of ad agencies everywhere, right? I think that it also bucks at the American dream, which has us striving in, in good ways, but sometimes in unhealthful ways that make us not take all of our vacation days in America or leaves paid maternity leave for all still a dream. To the ambitious, contentment could be confused with complacency, as if you're not caring or that you wouldn't work for justice if needed. But I think those are two very different things. There's an Indian priest named Anthony DeMello, and he shares a story of a wealthy industrialist from the north 
who was absolutely appalled when he came across a southern fisherman uh, lying leisurely next to his boat, and it was only noon. And so the industrialist asked the fisherman, why are you not fishing? And to that, the fisherman replied, well, because I've, I've caught enough for today. And the industrial will ask, you know, the question, well, why don't you, why don't you catch more? And the fisherman asks, well, what would I do with, with that? To which the industrial, you know, gets excited. You could see the entrepreneur in him, and he says, well, you could earn more money. And with more money, you could buy a motor to put on your boat, and you could go out into deeper water and catch more fish. And with the more fish and the more money earned, you could, you could get nylon nets and catch even more. And then with those more fish, you could maybe buy two boats, maybe a whole fleet of boats, and then maybe someday you would be rich, like me. To which the fisherman replied, well, okay, well, what would I do then? And the industrial says, well, you'd really enjoy life. To which the fisherman smiled and laid back down and tipped his hat and said, well, what do you think I'm doing right now? God, in our prayer to God, in the Lord's Prayer, we say, give us today our daily bread, right? Not bread for every day, bread to store up in our barns. Give us enough for today, God. And I don't think contentment means a lack of ambition. I don't think contentment has to mean a resentment of success. But I think contentment does recognize enough. Contentment, in a spiritual sense, values simplicity, and it comes from this deep and abiding trust in God and who God created you to be. See, Paul had a sense of that when he wrote even from prison to the Philippians, to the people in Philippi. These are some of his words. Paul says, I know what it is to have little, and I know what it is to have plenty. In any and all circumstances, I have learned the secret of being well-fed and of going hungry, of having plenty and of being in need. And then he adds this, how does he do that? I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength, he says. That last verse I've seen pinned up on plaques, and sometimes it's used as a reason to think, you know, I can do anything, literally that can-do American attitude. It's like a reason for excess ambition. But here Paul is showing us that actually it's contentment God is trying to get us to first. Contentment that comes in a deep trust in Christ, that whatever your lot, you can have this spiritual nourishment of your soul. I don't think God wants us all to be monastics. I also don't think, though, that your life has to stop for your soul to be satisfied. But it might take some intentionality. It might take an attitude of cultivating this contentment. When we worship, when we pray, when we read the scriptures, when we serve others, we're doing that. But also when we practice two simple words— Two simple words I think we use pretty often, but when used intentionally can help us in this. And they are no, no, and thank you. See, I think there's enough demand for our uh, attitudes and enough demand for our attention, things in our life that need real answers. We have marriages and families in trouble. Our children's behavior, our employment, our health, these are things that ask real things of us. On the other hand, there's other things, inanimate things, that it's much easier to say no to because they are simply that. They're not alive. And yet the stuff and the things, the status and the security that come with them so easily try to be our number one instead of God. They so easily, with each purchase and each click or each upgrade, chip away at contentment. So saying no to some of those things can actually be a spiritual discipline and exercise. Saying no to the comfort, to the stuff that only benefits you, in a way is saying yes to God. Yes to God's role in your life as the main supplier of all that you need and all of your purpose. Saying no can be a spiritual discipline. So the question I was wondering of the next nine days, just because it rhymes with no, um, is whether or not we can practice as a community of saying no. For nine days, when those things and those temptations come around, 
say no. I don't think the latte is going to cry. But then say no, but don't forget to be polite and say thank you. Not no thank you to the thing, but no to the thing and thank you to God. To take a moment when you've had the discipline to say no and say thank you, God, for what I already have. Thank you, God, for the things that money can't buy. Thank you, God, for the grace that loves me for where I am and who I am. Thank you, God, for the ability and the discipline to turn to the things that matter for real. Because I think we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. May we learn to want what we have instead of what we don't have. May we learn to live simply so others may simply live. May we learn to live generously, life that really is life. Amen.